the principle of contentment with what you've got. It's so important that the Buddha mentioned it three times when he was talking about the four customs of the Noble Ones. Three of the customs are contentment with what food you have, contentment with what clothing you have, contentment with what shelter you have. It's important to keep this in mind. And John Sawat said this was one of John Munn's favorite Dharma topics, the customs of the Noble Ones. Partly in response to people who kept accusing him of not following Thai and Laotian customs. Going out, living in the forest, eating only one meal a day. These were not the sort of things that monks were ordinarily doing in that time. Not going to bless houses, that kind of stuff. It's easy enough when we look at the customs of other cultures and see that they're strange. We have to remember that the customs of the Noble Ones go against our own culture as well. And contentment is one of the big things that really separates the customs of the Noble Ones from American, Western culture in general right now. Everyone is being trained not to be content. To want things just like this or just like that, to keep the economy going, to keep, I don't know, keep up appearances. So it's important to remember that the practice of the Dharma really breaks with that idea. You learn to be content with what you've got. Try to keep things simple because. The simpler your surroundings, the easier it is to practice. When you're not looking for happiness in your surroundings, or you're not getting happiness in your surroundings, things are not pleasing. Instead of trying to straighten out the situation outside, you try to straighten out the situation inside. There's no pleasure out there, or you look inside. This is where the fourth custom comes in, that you take delight in developing and delight in abandoning. In other words, we're not being stoic just to be stoic. Sometimes it's important that you hem the mind in, because it always has this tendency to want to go out and look for the pleasure outside. But when there's nothing there, you turn around and you look inside. You're forced. If you want any happiness, you want any contentment, it's got to be found right here. This applies not only to things, but also to relationships. If we're constantly looking for a good relationship with this person, that person, we're moving our focus in the direction where it shouldn't be going. It should be coming back in. Because relationships like things end. And just like things, our culture has a lot of pressure to go for relationships. And so there's partly that we're not doing our duty as members of our culture if we're not looking for a relationship and we don't look good in the eyes of other people. But again, if you're really serious about practicing the Dharma, you've got to say whatever you can do to simplify your life, you do that. Whatever you do to simplify your surroundings, you do that. And when things outside are not happy, things outside are not what, quite what you want them to be. You turn around and look for your, your pleasure in developing skillful qualities and abandoning unskillful ones. John Mahabua talks about the satisfaction that comes from seeing a little defilement, even if it's just a little defilement, falling off, like just a little piece of bark off a tree, he says. You've got to learn how to take satisfaction in that kind of accomplishment. So this is where we look for our pleasure. Notice the Buddha doesn't say, be content with what skillful qualities you have, or be content with what unskillful qualities you have. He's not teaching radical acceptance. 
He's saying you've got to learn how to focus your attention on where it really matters, where it really will make a difference. Because when you think about relationships, think about that comment he made one time that it's hard to meet anyone who has never been your mother or your father or your brother or your sister or your son or your daughter. Our relationships have been shuffling around so much that we've lost track of how many cards there are and how many different hands we've played. Is it just that thought should be enough to make you want to go for release instead? And John Fung's comment was, if there's a pleasure that you really hanker after, it's a sign that you had it in a previous lifetime and you miss it. And again, that too, he said, should make you want to go for release. Because if you get the pleasure again, you're going to lose it again, you're going to miss it again, you're going to hanker for it again, and just it's never-ending. There is no satisfaction in things. There is no satisfaction in relationships. Even really good relationships end. And when they end, they can be devastating. So that's why we turn and look inside. This is where we place all our efforts to change things, to change your mind, change your attitudes. Develop the skills inside that make it satisfying to change your mind, change your attitudes. That's where we should focus our attention. That's the culture of the Noble Ones. And just as a John Munn faced a lot of pressure to make his practice more like standard Thai practice or standard Lao practice, we get a lot of pressure to make the Dharma more American. What it seems to come down to is simply that it'll sell better. And we're not here selling the Dharma. We're here to practice the Dharma. And John Sawat once said, it, we're not here to get other people, we're here to get ourselves. And if other people see what we're doing, like what we're doing, they want to join in, that's fine. But the primary point has to be that we're practicing, that we are taking delight in developing skillful qualities and taking delight in abandoning unskillful ones. That's where you want to learn to be a connoisseur. That's where you want to have high standards as to what you will accept and what you won't accept. As for things outside, learn to be grateful for whatever you do get. Look around yourself here at the monastery. Everything here comes from someone's generosity. Nobody was forced to give anything. Nobody was given, giving anything out of a sense of obligation. It was out of the goodness of their hearts. So we should learn to be grateful for everything that comes our way and learn how to express that gratitude by delighting in developing skillful qualities and delighting in abandoning unskillful ones. So take this principle of contentment to heart. It's not just words, it's the way we live. And if it's not the way we're living, it's the way we should be living. As the Buddha once said, it's one of the principles that determines when a, when a particular practice or a particular attitude in the mind is in line or is not in line with the Dharma. Does it lead to contentment or does it lead to discontent? The Buddha himself said that discontent with regard to skillful qualities is an important principle. In fact, it was one of the principles that led to his own awakening. But as for contentment with with material things, that's something you really got to practice. So be clear as to where your contentment should be and where your discontent should be. If you see that you're still engaging in unskillful thoughts, or you're still causing stress one way or another to your own mind, okay, that's an area where you should not be content. You want to figure out what you're doing wrong, how you can change the situation. But as for material things, We've got more than enough here. Every time you use anything, remember, it's, you're using someone else's generosity, so you want to use it well. Use it with a sense of appreciation, because that's why they gave it, so that it would be used in the practice. 
training the mind. Even when you're out outside of the monastery where business is basically business as usual is business as usual. And not everything that comes your way is an act of generosity. Be sensitive to when it is. Have a sense of appreciation. And constantly be on the lookout to ways in which you can be countercultural, in other words, that you can embody the culture of the Noble Ones even, even as you're living in a very antagonistic culture, one that's trying to pull you away in all sorts of other directions. In some ways this makes you an outsider. But outsiders have a good position. They're not automatically sucked into all the craziness that you can find in every society. And there's a strength that comes with being an outsider. If your situation, your surroundings have to be a particular way, has to be like this, has to be like that, you're a hothouse creature. The temperature has to be just right, the humidity has to be just right, the fertilizer, the sunlight, everything has to be very carefully controlled, or otherwise you'll die. That's not a strong plant. The strong plants are the ones that can live in any situation, as a practitioner you want to try to make yourself strong in just that same way that you're willing to and able to thrive in any situation. And when you're responsible for having influence on the situation, do what you can to keep it simple so you can maintain your focus. Here at Wameta we're part of the forest tradition, but we're physically widely separated from where most of the tradition is being practiced in Thailand. But it's by trying to maintain the culture that we maintain a sense of closeness. And it's the same when you leave the monastery, trying to maintain these attitudes of contentment, food, clothing, shelter, and taking your delight not in having nice food or nice clothing, nice shelter, but taking delight in noticing when you can develop skillful qualities in the mind and when you can abandon unskillful ones. That's how you stay close. <laughs>